Hi, this is Group 37 presenting to you the Intuitionist and the Classical Natural Deduction. In this video, we will explain to you the history and background of Intuitionist and Classicist, followed by the differences between the former and the latter. But before we go on to our content of the video, let us first explain what Natural Deduction is. In logic and proof theory, Natural Deduction is a kind of formal system in which logical lo reasoning is expressed by inference rules closely related to the natural way of reasoning. Okay, let me give you an example. If I tell you, in summer it's warm, and now we're in summer, so now it's warm. You start using logical reasoning and inference rules and finally reply. Okay, I can prove that the reasoning you just made is correct. That is the use of natural deduction. Okay, let's put it in axiomatic form. All exponents is a very common rule of inference which takes the following form. If P implies Q, then if you suppose we have P, therefore we can conclude Q. Some stuff? Nah, actually we had just done it before. Look at the previous example, P actually refers to the statement summer, and Q actually refers to warm. Since we are in summer, we can therefore conclude it's warm. Okay, let us go to the topic proper. Firstly, I will introduce the classicist. Classical or so-called the traditional logic is a system of determining the validity or invalidity of conclusion deduced from two or more statements. It began way back from 384 BC to 332 BC with a famous Greek philosopher named Aristotle who came up with the rules of correct syllogistic reasoning. Its focus is not on what is stated but on the structure of the argument and the validity of the inference drawn from the premises. Of the argument. That is, if the premises are true, then the inference must also be true. Let me use an example to illustrate my point. Given the premise, n is an even number, if and only if it is equal to 2m plus 1, where m is a natural number. Therefore, we can conclude that 3 is an even number. But wait, why isn't 3 an odd number? This is because classicists focus only on the structure of argument and the validity of the inference. Even though our premise isn't completely commonly accepted, through the classic way of deduction, we can arrive at 3 is an even number. Classical logic describes laws of rational thinking. Since then, through the years, many famous mathematicians have contributed to the classical logic. The following are the axioms in classical logic from which inference rules are applied to derive many other proofs. Here is a quick look at the axioms that are used. Don't be frightened. Only a few are relevant to our discussion in the later part of the video. For example, the law of excluded middle and the double negation elimination. Let us take a brief look at the timeline of a classical logic's development. 322 BC, Aristotle started classical logic. 1847, George Poole formalizes symbolic logic in the mathematical analysis of logic defining what is now called Boolean Algebra. 1874, George Cantor. He proves that the set of all real numbers is uncountably infinite, but the set of all real algebraic numbers is countably infinite. His proof does not use his famous diagonal argument, which he published in 1891. In 1895, George Cantor publishes a book about a set theory containing the arithmetic infinite, cardinal numbers, and the continuum hypothesis. In the mid-19th century, the British mathematician George Boo and Augustine de Morgan opened a new field of logic, now known as symbolic logic or formal logic. In the early 20s, David Hubert, a mathematician who supported the classical logic further, developed the ideas from his predecessors. He proposed a research project that became known as Hubert's program. He wanted mathematics to be formulated on a solid and complete logical foundation. Classical logic is also the one that is recognized by many and being used in the recent years. Okay, now let's talk about intuitionists. Intuitionism is a branch of logic which stresses on mathematics has priority over logic. The objects of mathematics are constructed and operated upon in the mind by the mathematician, and it is impossible to define the properties of mathematical objects simply by establishing a number of axioms. Intuitionism came from the word intuition, which recognizes the individual mind as a definite faculty and act of direct apprehension. Besides the faculty and activity of reasoning, as the necessary foundation for all knowledge, 
both in the grasping of first principles on which a system of deductive reasoning is built, and as the critical link in every act of knowing between the knower and the object known. Intuitionist stands in contrast to a more general, rationalistic and deterministic trend, the classicism. An example to further illustrate my point. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. In this case, the set of all objects contains, among others, Socrates. And the set of predicates contains, among others, the predicate man and mortal. Now the elements of the set of the objects that are linked to the predicate man are contained in the set of elements linked to the predicate mortal. That is what the first premise states. Socrates, an element of the set of objects that is linked to the predicate man, is also linked to the predicate mortal, and this is expressed by saying that Socrates is a mortal. Thus, what corresponds to a linguistic regularity of syllogism is a comparatively simple mathematical construction. This is how the intuitionists interpret the previous statements. They project into the world of perception of mathematical system which consists of a finite set of objects and then linking some objects of this set to the elements of another set, namely set of predicates. Let us now look at the timeline for intuitionism. Intuitionism's history can perhaps be traced to the late half 19th century discussions between the German mathematicians George Cantor and his teacher Kronecker. George Cantor came up with the theory about sets with infinitely many elements, such as the set for natural numbers or the set of real numbers. However, he was criticized by Kronecker, who believed that only a finite number of elements can be understood by human minds. Kronecker's way of constructive approach to understand objects at that time sparks off the intuitionist way of thinking. In 1902, Gottlob Frege and Bertrand Russell had a similar discussion on the topic. However, it was in 1907 that intuitionism was properly introduced by the Dutch mathematician, Brouwer. Now I'll pass on to my friend who will discuss with you the differences between the intuitionism and the classical logic. I will discuss the different philosophy in the two fields, which will lead to the disagreements in principle of excluded middle and double negation elimination in the later part of the video. Looking at how we define classicism and intuitionism earlier on, we can conclude that these two ideologies are different from each other. In essence, intuitionist believes in human thought construction, while classicist believes in the theory of formal structures. To an intuitionist, any mathematical object is considered to be a product of a construction of a mind, and therefore, the existence of an object is equivalent to the possibility of its construction. This is in contrast with the classical approach, which states that the existence of an entity can be proved by refuting its non-existence. For the intuitionist, this is invalid. Let's take for example the De Morgan's laws. For example, if A is some mathematical statement that an intuitionist has not yet proved or disproved, then that intuitionist will not assert the truth of A or not A. However, the intuitionist will accept that A and not A cannot be true. Thus, the connectives and and or of intuitionist logic do not satisfy De Morgan's laws as they do in classical logic. This difference also leads to the rejection of the principle of excluded middle. As a result, many of the proofs in classical mathematics that utilize these axioms are invalid in intuitionist logic. In logic, the law of excluded middle states that for any proposition, either that proposition is true or its negation is. This is an example of how the principle of excluded middle is used. We seek to prove that there exist two irrational numbers A and B, such that AB is rational. It's known that square root 2 is irrational. Consider the number square root 2 to the power of square root 2. Clearly, this number is either rational or irrational. If it is rational, the proof is complete. And a equals to square root 2 and b equals to square root 2. But if square root 2 to the power of square root 2 is irrational, 
Then let a equals to square root 2 to the power of square root 2 and b equals to square root 2. Then a to the power of b equals to square root 2 to the power of square root 2 to the power of square root 2 equals to square root 2 to the power of square root 2 times square root 2 equals to square root 2 square equals to 2. And 2 is certainly rational. This concludes the proof. Is this a valid proof? Most mathematicians agree that it is, but there is something unsatisfying here. We have proved the existence of a pair of real numbers with a certain property, without being able to say which pair of number it is. In the above argument, the assertion this number is either rational or irrational invokes the law of excluded middle. An intuitionist, for example, would not accept this argument without further support for that statement. This might come in the form of a proof that the number in question is in fact irrational, or a finite algorithm that could determine whether the number is rational or not. The above proof is an example of a non-constructive proof disallowed by intuitionists. The proof is non-constructive because it doesn't give specific numbers a and b that satisfy the theorem, but only two separate possibilities, one of which must work. Let us look at a short video to further elaborate on the differences between classical and intuitionists. Where's the toilet? To the right, to the left. Hi, hi, hi. Excuse me, do you know where's the toilet? It's not to the right. I start to the right? Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, toilet. Which way is the toilet? It's not at the right. Then is it to the left? Can you bring me there? Okay, I agree. Thank you. Another theorem that the classicists and intuitionists had disagreement on is the double negation elimination. In propositional logic, the inference rules double negation allow deriving the double negative equivalent by adding or removing a pair of negation signs. In the theory of logic, double negation is expressed by saying that a proposition A is identical to not not A. Like the law of excluded middle, this principle when extended to an infinite collection of individuals is disallowed by intuitionistic logic. Because of their constructive flavour, a statement such as it's not the case that it's not raining is weaker than it's raining. The latter requires a proof of rain, whereas the former merely requires a proof that rain would not be contradictory. This is why intuitionists reject the law of double negation elimination. However, if I have the proof that it is raining, by experiencing rain itself, I can conclude otherwise, which is that it is not the case that it's not raining. This is also called the double negation introduction, which the intuitionist accepts. Let's look at another example to understand why intuitionists reject the double negation elimination. Suppose that I have been told by a reliable informant that in a town there is this one hairdresser store that provides excellent service and is free. Trying to locate it, I have made an investigation and found that on every street in that town, there is no hairdresser store except one particular street. By eliminating possibilities that a hairdresser is on this street to only one remaining possibility that have not been explored. I have enough evidence to say that it is not the case that there is no hairdresser store on this particular street. But we still do not have enough evidence to say that there is a hairdresser on this street until I walk through the street and see it there. Thank you for the great explanation. Despite the differences between intuitionists and classicists, 
Both logics are still applicable in the 21st century and some applications can be even seen in our daily lives. Synthetically, intuitionistic logic is a restriction of classical logic in which the law of excluded middle and the double negation elimination are not axiom of the system and cannot be proved. There are several semantics commonly employed. One semantics mirrors classical Boolean value semantics but uses hating algebras in place of Boolean algebras. Classical logic is still considered the mainstream in the current 21st century due to the nature of constructive methods that places too much of a burden on mathematics and makes the solution of proofs seem complicated. Classical mathematics also point to its usefulness and applications in the development of science and technology. On the other hand, with the rise of computer, there is also a good deal of interest in algorithmic aspects of mathematics, which is the method employed in intuitionistic logic. Intuitionistic logic is particularly useful because its restriction produces proofs that have existence property, making it also suitable for other forms of mathematical constructism. Informally, this means that given a constructive proof that an object exists, then that constructive proof can be turned into algorithm for generating an example of it. Thank you for watching the video. Hope you enjoy it.